I got involved with this in a, in, a, in a quite remarkable way. I used to work on socialist worker, and so did Mike Simons, who may be well known to you, wrote a brilliant book on the miners. And he discovered the English language of this uh, book in his attic. It was first produced in New York by the New York Bund at the end of the war. Neither of us knew anything about it, or Marek Edelman, both of us from Jewish backgrounds, with Jewish education through the synagogue system, blah, 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 and both realised the word Bund had never been mentioned once. And this pamphlet had never been produced in Britain. And there was no Bund organisation in Britain like there had been in New York, so the Zionists couldn't get away with simply trying to erase, which, by the way, they have tried to do in Israeli history. The Bund is erased. Um, anyway, cut long story short, we contacted Marek Edelman. Very, thanks very much to Andy Zabrowski, who is part of our Polish organisation, helped me find, get an interview with Marek Edelman, which I did. In 1989, he was involved in the wonderful, uh, in, in, in the beginnings of the destruction of the Stalinist regime there and the replacement uh, after the Solidarity Uprising, etc., etc., etc. And he agreed that Bookmarks could be the first publisher of his memoir. That's the background to this, and we did that issue in 1990. This is the second edition, and it does have a very different introduction to the first one, for reasons which I'll explain uh, afterwards, because there's such a lot to talk about. Um, but I, I, if you've got it, you don't need to buy it, uh, again, obviously. But it is a different introduction. One thing it does have, which I'm particularly pleased with, I had the most vicious row in the Jewish community about the book last time around, and part of that row appeared on the letters columns of the Jewish Chronicle. Um, and we've reproduced that in the appendix. I'm particularly proud of that for reasons you'll realise when you read uh, 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 the, uh, the appendix, if you are able to do so. OK, so that's the kind of background. Also, just on the, one other point of background. As you, some of you may know, I was very much involved in the UCU, the University College Lecturers Union, for many years. In the last three or four years, myself and Tom Hickey and Phil Marfleet and several other comrades helped to launch and spearhead the boycott disinvestment <coughs> sanctions campaign and the academic boycott. And this was a vicious fight, which you know we, we won absolutely hands down. And please read Tom's article in this month's Socialist Review for a very good summation of how we got to. Um, but on Holocaust Memorial Day uh, in 2010, both sides came together, believe it or not. The anti Zionist Zionists came together at UCU headquarters, and I delivered the talk I'm delivering now, or an adaptation of it. And that also became part of the new introduction. So that, that, that's the background to this. Um, so. Let's get into the story, and just to underline the point, this is a very depressing story. I mean, everybody, quite rightly, wants to get excited by the ghetto fights. And notice Mary Gettleman doesn't use the word uprising, he uses fights. And he, was always, he always hated the romanticisation which occurred with the Zionists grabbed it, uh, a great Jewish uprising for freedom, which found its full climax in Palestine when Palestine became Israel, blah, blah, blah. But also the Stalinists use it. The greater because they claimed, with some justification, the communists were part of the, of the, of the Jewish fighting organisation. They also claimed it. And he always wanted to play it down, play it down, play it down, because it was so horrendous. And it was fights. And they didn't really win. They, 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 they halted the Nazi death machine momentarily. And in the end, the Nazis had to set the ghetto on fire. So that's kind of a word of warning, very much reflecting the mood of Edelman when I met him and everything he's ever written about in the interviews that he's given. Now, when we enter the sealed world of the ghetto, sealed by the Nazis after the occupation of Poland, the joint occupation of Poland by the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany in 1939, the Nazis into, into Warsaw, and the sealing of the ghetto, and the herding of, of three, about three to 400,000 Jews across Poland, beyond Poland, into the ghettos, into the Warsaw Ghetto in particular, which of course was the largest. And the deportations began quite quickly. And I always say that I, I believe this story confronts even the most hardened revolutionary socialist with, with quite complex moral and political paradoxes. It's not straightforward at all. When you try to imagine yourself in that sealed world, it's easy to make hindsight judgments. What kind of judgments would you make when you were there? Especially because one of the most appalling facts is that the first 200,000 Jews deported to the, to the death camps did so without any resistance whatsoever. That's a huge number. Now, I'm conscious of the time, and I have a long discussion about this in the introduction. And by the way, I should have thanked Sally Campbell at the beginning uh, for putting together this issue, this edition of the book, very, very quickly so it could be out for Marxism, uh, Sally Campbell at Bookmarks. And I also want to thank Professor Antony Polonsky, who's probably the world's leading historian on Polish Jewish history, who's a liberal Zionist, um, but is a very, very serious independent academic 
And when I, got, when I had a big fight with the Zionists in 1990, he, he supported me, and he read through the introduction of this and made one or two comments, etc. So an invaluable ally, giving the introduction a, a sort of credibility that perhaps it wouldn't have. I just mentioned that in passing because I meant to mention it at the beginning. Uh, and, and, and the question of these paradoxes, this is one of them. He himself has explored this, and there's some important quotes from research that he has done as to why, about Jewish passivity in the face of the, of the threat which I don't want to dwell on this now, I just want to assert that it was deep and intense and difficult to move, and it only finally moved when the fighters began to organise. I always think to myself and say at these sorts of meetings, what lessons do we learn? And this is the first immediate lesson, the importance of organisation, that you're not going to get resistance unless there is very, very serious organisation. The first paradox I think we face is as the realisation that the trains were leaving for death camps began to dawn right across the Jewish community. Remember, the Nazis got away with their rule because they ruled through the Jewish council. They ruled through kind of puppets, quizzlings of different types, Jewish police and Jewish leaders who were incorporated into the Nazi machine. And obviously, they are targets for condemnation. But the leader of the Warsaw Council was a man called Adam Chernovich. And um, he committed suicide. And there's a long argument. There's been an argument ever since about whether he was justified in taking his own life. As you'll see from the book, the Ghetto Fighters, and Mary Cuddle in particular, uh, condemned the suicide. And of course, easy to identify with them, and so of course we'll condemn it. And of course, I will say I condemn it. But I just want to throw in this qualification, and I, I mentioned the argument about this as an example of this paradox, that there is a, a serious independent uh, Warsaw Ghetto historian, who's an Israeli, he's now an Israeli, he's a Zionist, there's a serious historian, he says, hang on a minute, and again, I quote him at length in the introduction, he says, hang on, he said, you can't condemn Chernikov because the ghetto resistance hadn't started. Why hadn't the ghetto resistance started? Because they were too busy squabbling amongst themselves. I'm slightly paraphrasing and simplifying. Simplifying, it's just what he says. The three organisations that finally came together to form the ghetto resistance came from three hard political tendencies who were bitterly hostile to each other. The communists, the Zionist socialists, and the Jewish socialist Bund. Again, I'm not going to go into the politics of the Jewish socialist Bund, um, and I'm, I, I will in question time, just because I don't really have the time. I, there's very good references in, in the introduction, and I particularly recommend Cy Englert's uh, uh, best study that we've done in I, one of the international socialism journals recently, um, for people who want to know about it. But in a word, the important thing about the Jewish Socialist Bund is that they were anti-Zionist. That's very important. And, and in terms of the sectarianism in the ghetto, the Bund allied themselves with the Polish Socialist Party outside, believing that alliance would cement the, the basis for the resistance. They did not believe they could ally with the Zionists, because the Zionists historically had not resisted anti-Semitism in pre-war Poland. At the same time, and, and the Bund in one sense could see in the ghetto that the young, even the young Zionists, who were the better, and became very good fighters, but even the young Zionists, even the young Zionists who called them socialists, were obsessed with the idea that Hitler, Hitler's advance into Poland proved the view that anti-Semitism was endemic, made inevitable the destruction of the Jews in Europe, and made essential the emigration to Palestine as quickly as possible. And even in the ghetto, young Zionists were preparing to find ways of escaping out of the ghetto to find some kind of secret routes to Palestine. And that inhibited the struggle. And the communists, in a different way, thought they could fight on their own because they had the mighty Soviet Union around the corner. And that did delay the formation of the Jewish fighting organisation. And in that sense, I also believe we have to think twice, think twice, not necessarily change our view, when we come to make a judgment about Chernikov's suicide. It's a complicated discussion, and I, I highlight it here because it's a good example of the kind of paradox that you face. Now, we come on to the beginnings of the resistance, and uh, I'm, I'm not really quite sure whether I've got time for quotes or not. Actually, I'm going to skip quotes and maybe come back at the end with one or two quotes. A, what Edelman says is, he just says how hard it was. I mean, quite apart from fusing the organisations, he just says any form of resistance is really hard. You can't imagine what it was like. First of all, we're all starving. None of us, my guests. I've got any idea what it's like to be constantly hungry, day in, day out, under conditions of extreme repression. You just do not know how that mood would affect your political judgment, political activity. I don't know. I like to think I'd be a quarter as brave as Marek Edelman, but would I, do I know for certain? No, I do not. So that's terribly important that, to bear that in mind. But he, he, he talks about how to get activity going, and he says, we learnt the lesson from the children. The children taught all of us, six-year-old boys and girls, sneaking under the barbed wire behind the Nazi gendarmes at the, at the edge and finding food, 
begging food, stealing food um, from Poles outside, and non-Jewish Poles outside, and bringing it back into the ghetto. And Edelman quite rightly cites that as the first form of resistance. And there's a long discussion uh, of other, other examples of how the children, being courageous and brave, kind of gave a kind of bravery and courage to the, to the adults um, in the ghetto. And um, finally, these three organisations I mentioned did come together. And the several pages in Marek Edelman's account of the resistance, which I stress he calls fights, not uprising, because they, they are kind of single fights, but they are quite extraordinary. I mean, I think, how are we doing on time, Chair? Am I halfway yet? Uh, no. Okay, let me just give you this quote, because my favourite... I've got two favourite quotes, and this is one of them. Um, now the SS... This is, this is as, as, the, as, as, the, as the fights begin. Now the SS men are ready to attack. In close formations, stepping haughtily and loudly, they marched into the seemingly dead streets of the central ghetto. Their triumph appeared to be complete. It looked as if, as if this superbly equipped modern army had scared off the handful of bravado drunk men, as if those few immature boys had at last realised that there was no point in attempting the unfeasible. This is how he describes them. The, a few immature boys, there's a, hundred teen, a, a few hundred teenagers only. This is not a great rising of the 60,000 left in the ghetto. This is armed, armed teenagers, I think they're all boys, uh, uh, taking on the Nazis. But no, they didn't scare us. And we were not taken by surprise. We were only waiting an opportune moment. Battle groups barricaded at the four corners of the street opened concentric fire on them. Strange projectiles began exploding everywhere. The hand grenades of our own make, the lone machine pistols sent shots through the air now and then. Ammunition had to be carefully conserved. They attempted a retreat, but their path was cut. Their dead littered the streets. Absolutely incredible. And there's three or four pages like that. And it's an extraordinary story. And it's in that sense. They did halt the Nazi death machine. That was a kind of short-term victory. And the Nazis then did have to set the ghetto on fire, as I said before. And so that is incredibly impressive. It's very exciting. But we do have to keep a sense of proportion. And it's at this point in the talk that I change gear completely. I want us to go back. Forget about what a brilliant example of the fight that was, and notice two or three phrases, one I've just read out. Um, hand grenades of our own make, a lone machine pistol firing only occasionally to conserve ammunition. These remarks of Edelman, echoed in other memoirs, have been seized upon by some historians. Don't they prove the deep-rooted endemic anti-Semitism, the anti-Jewish hatred of the wider Polish society, or why even the anti-Nazi Polish underground was unable or unwilling properly to arm the ghetto. Now, this is incredibly important, and I want to spend some time on this, because it's a source of constant confusion. It superficially offers a propaganda victory to the Zionists, who say this confirms what I've just said. Even the Polish underground are anti-Semitic. You can never trust the Poles. Jews were in Poland for a thousand years. All they got was anti-Semitism, and then in the end, Poles helped the Nazis kick uh, the exterminators. Um, Three quarters of Israelis believe one version of that story or another. Um, but there's something quite fascinating that, and, and it was easy to dismiss Marek Edelman, because Marek Edelman, quite remarkably, in fact, he was the only senior ghetto fighter, only senior ghetto fighter, who insisted on staying in Poland, insisted he was Polish became incidentally a surgeon, and remained and retained that position to his dying day. First and foremost, he was Polish. Yes, he was Jewish, but he certainly wasn't in any way Israeli. Absolutely terribly important point. Now, one of Edelman's comrades was a fighter called Antek Zuckerman. He was also part of the five-person command group um, that led the rising. And Antek Zuckerman wasn't only a Zionist, uh, uh, when he finally died, he also survived. When he finally died, he, he went to Israel and finally insisted on being uh, joined the, what was called the Ghetto Fighters Kibbutz in Israel and is buried on it. So he's a very different witness. But what's fascinating for me is that Zuckerman has the same view as Edelman. I want to just read a few remarks that he says. This is obviously all taken from the introduction. Uh, and, and by the way, Antek is the liaison with the Polish underground that makes, his, makes him as a witness even more important. With my own eyes, this is when the, when the ghetto is on fire, with my own eyes I saw Poles crying, just standing and crying. One day the ghetto was shrouded in smoke and I saw masses of Poles without a, without a trace of spiteful malice. 
He even called it a sin, Antek called it a sin, to foster hatred of the Polish people. And he also knew a great deal about, he had lots to say about Polish solidarity. Here he is describing rank and file Polish communists. Until they were corrupted by the authority, and even more so by Stalin, those people demonstrated exceptional personal movement, personal and movement integrity. This is incredibly important, and what a wonderful witness. Um, but he even goes further. This is not a particularly sophisticated political person. He's certainly not a Marxist, but he says this. And for me, this is the most important quote of all in terms of addressing the allegation of endemic Polish anti-Semitism. He says, he says, Antek says, says, the Polish street in those days was pro-Jewish, unambiguously, not sitting on the fence, pro-Jewish. It was spontaneous and could go either way, but AKA, the Polish underground and, it and its leadership decided not to help. Now, this is absolutely key because it's true the Polish underground was slow at arming the ghetto, very slow. And this is one, of, and it's the leadership. And they can't say they were reflecting the wishes of the Polish street. We've got the best witness conceivable that that wasn't the case. On the contrary, um, one, of the, one of many reasons they give for being slow about arming the ghetto is that they were worried about a wider rising, which they say they weren't prepared for. They weren't militarily ready for a wider citywide rising in 1943. It came in 1944. Now, I'm in no position to judge about that, but it's an important consideration to bear in mind when we make judgments about how we understand the behaviour of the Polish underground. But there's something much more important than that when it comes to understanding the Polish, the Polish underground. Um, there's a word in Polish, and it's the only Polish I will say. Um, I'm terribly nervous even to say this. Um, I'm going to spell it. No, I'm not. Is it, is it, is it a How did it go, Andy? Shout it for us. Jew hatred. Jew communism. Jew communism. That's it. That's it. Jew communism was, was, was deeply embedded in the Polish underground leadership. And this was a central factor. It's a central factor because if you go through the list, the three organisations I mentioned, the communists, the Zionist socialists, and the Jewish socialist Bund, as far as the leadership of the Polish underground was concerned, and they're all right -wing, Polish right-wing nationalists, and to one degree or to another, they're, they're, they're anti-Semitic. It's, it's not Nazi anti-Semitism. It's, it's, it's doubts about Jews in different versions, one form or another. And there's one version I want to come on to in a moment because it's terribly important. It's a sophisticated political. I want to come on to it in a moment. And it's different to this point I make. I want to just focus and stress this point I'm making, is that they regarded... Because the three organised... By the way, Zionist socialism, it might seem completely ridiculous to us now, and I spent a lot of time in the midst of Zionism discussing Zionist socialism, but it was a powerful force to such an extent that even at one stage were part of the Comintern and the very early Zionist socialists. There was a view you could be a Zionist and a Marxist. The Zionist socialists would join with Marek Edelman and the Bundis and sing the Internationale in the ghetto. For example, um, from the point of view of the Polish right-wing nationalists and the running the Polish underground, that lot, the communists and the Bund, they're all Jewish communists, and they're all essentially opening the door to Stalin. Now, Andy Zabrowski and I, who we just heard give that wonderful Polish description, a Polish word, had a long and quite rancorous email argument about this. Uh, because I, I maintain, there's kind of, however annoying it is to have to do this, there's a kind of element of truth in the Polish nationalist position. Not at all that you can support it, but of course, unfortunately, in the end, there wasn't an alternative. There wasn't any chance of an independent socialist alternative, given the, 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 the dynamic of the war and the kind of the, the, the enormity of the Soviet Union. It's, a, it's an argument we might have. We reached a kind of compromise discussion about it, and it appears in, in introduction. We're both very comfortable with it. But it's, it's a complicated argument, um, and that's, that was a key factor. But there's something else that I learnt from Andy in that discussion about the nature of. Uh, of, well, uh, I mean, it is a sort of Polish anti-Semitism, but it's, it's different. And I, I write it like this. Such prejudices, such prejudices fitted with a mindset amongst some of the right-wing Polish nationalist leaders who saw the Jews as a separate nation in Poland, hence not part of Poland's national community, separate from Poland's struggle for national liberation. If you think about that, it's a kind of, it's a kind of mild form of anti-Semitism, but in its own way very, very pernicious. And it also concedes, by the way, both, not just the Zionists, the Bund, in a peculiar way, agreed with them. 
One of, one of the weaknesses of Bund's politics, they also saw the Jews as a nation in Poland. Their difference was, we don't go to Palestine, we try to find ways of expressing national rights in independent Poland. This was very deeply rooted, this idea of a separate nation, separate people. But it also offered a kind of an additional excuse for the problems of arming the Polish underground. One other point to bear in uh, the, the ghetto resistance. Another imp important point to bear in mind, however, when it came to the Polish underground citywide rising against the Nazis a year later, they themselves didn't have enough arms. This wasn't bullshit. They genuinely were underarmed. And, uh, when the, and uh, despite the fact the Polish underground was kind of openly allied with the war effort led by Churchill in Europe, when they, when, they, when they sent envoys to Britain to get arms, Churchill said no. Uh, so so, so this, uh, an additional problem was, although the Polish underground undoubtedly could have and should have given far more arms to the Jewish resistance fighters, they were actually short of arms themselves, and that was quite clear when the uprising, the wider uprising started a year later. Very important. Now, I'll move to the final part of this discussion, which kind of flows directly from that, because this raises the question of, of the communists and the Soviet Union. And for me, this is the most important paradox of all, of all the paradoxes that we have to confront. Because on the one hand, no one can deny the, the genuinely heroic role of Soviet soldiers in resisting the Nazis. Anyone who's read um, a wonderful novel, like, is it Life and Fate, uh, by Grossman, of the fight at Stalingrad, the single most important city struggle that turned the war, um, no one can both not be incredibly impressed by, by the, the, the Soviet soldiers and the degree to which they themselves were being radicalised away from Stalin in, 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 in those struggles, in those fights with, with, in, in a part of the war effort. And, in, and, and by the way, the Soviets, uh, uh, out of 11 million killed by the Nazis in death camps, were always mentioned 6 million Jews, which there were, 11 million altogether, three of those other million were Soviet soldiers who were killed, tortured to death in the death camps. So, no one can deny, in one sense, the Soviet Union's heroic struggle against the Nazis. But that's only one side of the story, which is a paradox. The other side of the story, the reason why Auschwitz happened at all, in part, is because of the treachery of Stalin and his relations with Hitler throughout the 1930s. First of all, we have the complete failure of the, of the German Communist Party to ally with the Social Democrats. This is Trotsky's, uh, observed by Trotsky, written about in one of Trotsky's most brilliant writings about the importance of the United Front. That opened the door to Hitler in, in, in Germany in 1933, the failure to build the United Front in Germany. Much more serious, though, was the Nazi-Soviet pact in 1939. Hitler and Stalin together essentially decided to carve up Poland, and they really did have this pact where they sent each other the names of potential resistance fighters to be picked up, rounded, and, and, and killed. I mean, Stalin actually sent Hitler the names of hundreds of communists to be rounded up. The Bund were broken up, by the way. Edelman's organisation, its leaders, two of them ended up in, in, in Moscow. One of them, uh, Edelman, uh, uh, um, Alter and Ehrlich, one of them committed suicide, the other one was killed. There's been three or four Bundists in London, I got to know all of them in the last few years. All of them, nearly all of them, had been deported to Soviet labour camps when, they, when, when the Soviets went in. It is absolutely atrocious, and one of the problems one of the problems in this whole discussion, a problem that kind of fits the perspective of the Polish nationalists from the point of view of the ordinary Pole, from the point of view of the ordinary Pole, the, the, the Stalin was as bad as Hitler. The Soviet was as bad as the Nazi. Of course, from the point of view of the Jew, that's not true. However horrendous Stalin was, he didn't open death camps for Jews. And there was, so there was a built-in contradiction between the Pole and the Jew in that sense. I'm, I'm, I shouldn't really say Pole and Jewish Jews, I should say uh, non-Jewish Poles and, and, and Jewish Poles. But for simplicity's sake, I'm going to fall into the trap uh, that I mentioned before, but for simplicity's sake, I'm talking about Poles and Jews. That, that inevitably, uh, there was a contradiction between the two, which, kind of, which added to the, the difficulty of getting the kind of solidarity that was necessary. Now, I don't know, I'm going to have to literally do headlines for the final part of the story, which is that the 1944... Just to kind of underline the treachery of Stalin, when the Polish underground rising citywide begins, and rather remarkably, what a remarkable two men, both Marek Edelman and Antek Zuckerman. Edelman, who'd escaped through the sewers with a band of fighters when the, when the ghetto was on fire, he describes a brilliant description of escaping through the ghetto and literally appearing in the street of War Warsaw out of a manhole, suddenly appears in daylight, but uh, dozens of uh, ghetto fighters, unfortunately to the credit of the Polish underground, they knew about it, there are two lorries waiting, 
and they whisked them off. And Edelman stayed in Warsaw till the citywide rising, and both him and Zuckerman, both looked Jewish, had to go to, in disguises. Not because they were obviously worried about the Nazis, but they were also worried about fellow Poles. So let's not, let's not lose sight of the fact that, that Polish anti-Semitism could go either way, and, it, and it, was a, it was worrying in this atmosphere. Remarkably, Zuckerman and Edelman both took part in the citywide rising. It was put down by the Nazis, even in 1944, because Stalin held back the Red Army outside the, 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 the Warsaw boundary for the Nazis to break the resistance before Stalin went in. I mean, the, the, the history of this alone is quite extraordinary. Now, I'm bringing my remarks to a close, and uh, this is my last passage that I want to read. Some of you will be familiar with this if you've heard this talk before, and it, of course, is in the uh, introduction. Um, and I've just lost it, of course. This is the Manifesto to the Poles, which is, I believe, one of the greatest... Um, <coughs> ..documents of the last century. Yes, it is in the book, it is in the book. It is absolutely in the book. Well, this, is, this is Manifesto to the Poles. It was, put, it, was, it was put out, literally, as the ghetto was set on fire. Poles, citizens, soldiers of freedom through the din of German cannon destroying the homes of our mothers, wives and children, through the noise of their machine guns seized by us in the fight against the cowardly German police and SS men, through the smoke of the ghetto that was set on fire and the blood of its mercilessly killed defenders, we the slaves of the ghetto convey heartfelt greetings to you. This is the ghetto fighters to the Poles. We are well aware that you've been witnessing breathlessly with broken hearts and tears and compassion, with horror and enthusiasm, the war that we've been waging against every brutal occupier. Every doorstep in the ghetto became a stronghold and, we shall, and, and remained a fortress until the end. All of us will probably perish, but we'll never surrender. We, as, as well as you, are burning with the desire to punish the enemy. It's a fight for our freedom as well as yours, for our human dignity and national honour as well as yours. We'll avenge the gory de deeds of Auschwitz, Treblinka, Belgium, etc. Long live the fraternity of blood and weapons in a fighting Poland. Long live freedom, death to the hangman and killer. We must continue our mutual struggle with, against the occupier till the very end. Signed, Jewish Armed Resistance Organisation. It's a magnificent document, as I say, one of the greatest appeals for solidarity in the 20th century, and it draws together the key lessons, the lessons that we need to learn in the new fight against all versions of fascism, which are now throughout different, at different levels of intensity throughout Europe, and there are three key points, terribly simple, but really almost born out of blood in terms of the ghetto resistance. And it, and it proved difficult to get, it, get to each stage, and the last stage never completely was satisfied. What's the first one? Organisation. Yes, they got organisation, but it was slow in coming. Two, unity. They united the three key organisations, but it was slow in coming. And finally, three, solidarity. That's a great appeal of solidarity, but we have to be completely honest. There wasn't enough solidarity between the Polish underground non-Jewish and the Polish underground Jewish. There wasn't enough solidarity, and, and, and for the reason I've tried to explain. But we learned the lessons that we need three. We need the organisation, we need the unity, and we need the solidarity. When those three components are in place, there's no question we can defeat the Nazis. Thank you. Yeah, um, first of all, I want to thank for this wonderful talk. It was really great. And inspiring. Um, secondly, I wanted to reinforce one argument is that the unity uh, between the different uh, groups of resistance wasn't born out of thin air, it was born in struggle and it couldn't have uh, and, and it couldn't be imagined otherwise. John told us the story how much differences they had and how much reasons uh, they might have had to hate each other. Uh, for example, the, the murder of the, the Bundes leaders uh, by the Stalinists. And another example um, is, for, is, is how Zionists who united in Warsaw by the fighting didn't do the same in, uh, when, when they were isolated. The author of a comic which is very, very famous now, it's uh, Captain America, um, started the comic in the 40s. And uh, Captain America was fighting the Nazis in in the first versions of the, in the first editions of the, of the comic book. And at the same time, um, Captain America fought the Bundists and he called them, uh, you Nazis come Bundists or something. You, you, you can look it up in the internet. These old comics are all to be downloaded by Pirate Bay. 
Um, <laughs> um, and well, it's quite impressive to see how the propaganda from from isolated people uh, went in a total different direction from those fighters in the ghetto who had to unite to be successful and who, who uh, are really brave. The second thing I wanted to mention is about the uh, Polish underground. Um, the, the author of a book about the Treblinka uprising, he was one of the survivors of the Treblinka, Treblinka uprising, you know, the death camp where so many uh, uh, Jewish people were killed in, in the late 40s, uh, in, 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 the, in the end of the war. They, um, some, some of them, or many of them, through the uprising, managed to escape and go to, uh, to the Polish cities. And they joined the resistance, the Polish underground. In order to arm themselves, the first thing they had to do, they had to uh, beat down or murder an SS or Gestapo or some, somebody, uh, some German soldier to get the arms. There was no way they could get arms just by joining the resistance. They had to do this first step. So, uh, survive the death camp, uh, make the, survive this uprising, go to the city, and then again confront the Nazi officer just in order to arm themselves. And men and women had to do this. Uh, yeah, I mean, just a, a, a thing about the question of, uh, of, of organization in the ghetto. I mean, uh, I, I take John's uh, note about the fact that it's easy with kind of, you know, 60 years later outside of the ghetto, all of that, to pass judgment. I do think there's a question around the suicide of Chernyakov, for example, and the fact that at the time, one of the main attacks uh, against him for, for, for committing suicide is the fact that he has access to an incredible amount of information, uh, commands a real respect in the ghetto, uh, is a respected figure that can put a call out to the entire ghetto and doesn't, takes his life and kills himself. And it's something that the resistance, uh, uh, that, that, that the resistance really, really condemned him for. So I, I'm not sure I, I, I kind of share the, 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 the same, the, the, uh, maybe the same level of, uh, of, of, of understanding than John does, but I do, take, I do take the fact that it's quite easy to feel like that today. I think the question of organization is crucially important though, because it is true that although Chernyakov, instead of committing suicide by making a call out, could have strengthened the organization, the, the inverse is true as well. If organization existed in the ghetto, Chernyakov might have felt, and others uh, in his position that took positions of trying to limit the damage as much as possible, might have felt like it was actually possible to join uh, a, a different course of action, to join the kind of the joint, uh, the joint resistance in the ghetto. But on that, I kind of have a question and a comment really for John, which is that the sectarianism in the ghetto is really an anomaly for the Bund. If you look at the Bund in the pre-war years, its resistance to uh, fascism is exemplary really in terms of what we understand as the necessity of the United Front in, uh, against fascism, uh, its unity both with the Polish socialists, but also with sections of the, the, the socialist Zionist movement, joint strike action, joint May Day demonstration, joint responses to uh, uh, pogroms in Poland, all of that. There is a real uh, a unity uh, in the socialist movement at which the Bund is at the heart of in the run-up uh, uh, to the war against, you, you know, not the Nazis, but against Polish, uh, against Polish fascism, which disappears uh, for too many years inside of the bone and uh, inside of the ghetto, and I think that's something quite uh, I don't really know what to call it, but the, the 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 fact that it probably has something to do with ghetto life, the difficulties of of ghetto life, and that the sectarianism actually, you know, uh, ironically, is actually linked to the realities of the ghetto rather than to the politics of the Bund originally. I think. Yeah, thanks, John. A uh, brilliant talk as usual. Um, look, I think last year we started the, the biggest anti-fascist demonstration that we had. It's only like between one and two thousand people. So, who, so uh, who you are? Uh, Andy Sprosky from the Polish uh, uh, sister organisation of the SWP. Um, and we started it at the Ghetto Mon Monument, and we said this is the best place in the world to start. <coughs> an anti-fascist demonstration and that's true if you look at just simply the scale of the destruction of fascism 10 percent of the population of pre-war poland was jewish that was virtually wiped out except for a few tens of thousands 
10% of the population, 3 million people. One third of Warsaw, imagine one third of London being exterminated. One third of Warsaw was Jewish. They were exterminated. So that's the scale of the thing. And really, you know, we, you can t treat talks like this as, you know, one, inspiration, fight back, two, horrible tragedy, aren't na Nazis na nasty? But really, we have to take organisational conclusions from this, because in a time of crisis, it is not inevitable that things all go our way. There's a, a Polish fascist who led uh, <coughs> about 50 football fans and Nazis into Zygmunt Bauman's uh, lecture in Wrocław uh, just recently. Zygmunt Bauman, on, on, the, on the excuse that he was a Stalinist uh, in the 40s, which he was, because he believed in the crap that it was Stalinism was socialism. He left them afterwards, of course. But he was forced out of Poland as a Jew, because there was an anti-Semitic campaign in so-called Workers' State Poland in 1968, so-called Communist Poland. And they used that, the, the excuse was not that he was Jewish, of course, the, the excuse that he had been a Stalinist. But the guy who le led that wrote a pamphlet called Why I Came to Love Hitler, and that's in Poland, that's in Polish, a Polish pamphlet. And um, it's not ironic, it's not one of those Spike Milligan type things or something, it's a, it's, a gen, it's a genuine thing. So what really what I want to say is the importance of politics and political organisation. Because in Poland you did have examples, for instance, Jews being rounded up by Poles in barns and, and the things set on fire on the one hand. And then you had someone like Irena Sendler, who, who saved thousands of children, who was linked to the Polish socialists before the war. It's not an accident that the places where the barns were, were burned were where the, where the fascists could organise, where the extreme right organised, and the people that, that were organising the, the, the help for, for Jews were, were, were linked to socialists, organised socialists. And that, uh, that, that I think, is the, the real key to it, especially... You, you, for instance, nowadays, in today's Europe, you have, all right, the, the example of the Polish guy, you have a Golden Dawn member being the outside of Auschwitz, smiling, being photographed. Look at this. This is the kind of climate we're entering into as the crisis deepens and people are getting very, very, very bitter. And really, we really, really have to be organised. This is not just a, please join the party because I'm in this organisation, I want you to be with me. This is really something that's objectively happening now. The, the forces of the right, I was really phenomenally uh, kind of impressed by what the SWP has done in the United against fascism in Britain. When Rigby got killed, I thought this could lead to a horrible, horrible backlash because it's, you know, I don't have to explain why. It didn't because of socialist organisation. Draw your own conclusions. Before the next speaker, is there other, other people who want to? Okay, do you come up? Yeah, just three things really. The first thing I wanted to disagree with John a little bit about, about one thing, because I think it's, it's absolutely correct to say that you shouldn't romanticise the resistance that happens inside the ghetto, but I still I still think for the vast majority of people around us, right, stuff the story of the Holocaust is one of no resistance, right, stuff about it, and therefore I think it's you know I, I understand what you're saying. It doesn't seem to be anybody could glamorise the idea of having to, to, to fight to fight back in the way that the comrades did, right, stuff about it. But I think that's the important point. The second thing is to go back to context because the whole situation. And which we've John tra tra back to. Why did we get here? Right, so we got we got back into a situation where the Nazis were able to seize power off the back of a, a massively a, a massively organised working class in Germany and stuff. And therefore, it's it's, it's, it's fascinating when you read Trotsky's writings on Germany. Right, stuff about, about it. what he talks about is that the events in 1932 and 1933 will shape the world for decades to come. Right, and stuff. And it's the experience of people in in Europe and stuff was was, was precisely that. The third thing, really, is, is that the rise in the ghetto is part of the argument, really, and stuff about a war within a war, right? Stuff that goes on continually, right? Stuff across across Europe, because our picture again is one of 
vast armies battling one another out, really, and stuff about it, and the you know the, the role of America and superpowers and the rest of it. But inside all these countries and all these resistance movements, politics played themselves out. So, so comrades have been talking about the situation in Poland. We know, you know, in France, the role of the left inside the resistance movements, stuff in Italy, in Greece, the fact that British troops were being used to break with the resistance movement at the same time as they were supposed to be fighting the Germans and the rest of it and stuff. And so it seems to me it's important for us to try to win an argument as well about uh, uh, about the kind of processes that were going on within the war itself. It's not true that people, both in the Jew amongst Jews or amongst people across Europe, were passive in the, face, in the face of resistance. It's not true. It was simply a relationship with the Allies. The politics played itself out. The left played itself out. And actually, in a whole number of countries at the end of the war, in Italy and Greece and other, other countries, if it hadn't been for the politics of the left, if it hadn't been for the influence of Stalinism, the left could have made massive breakthroughs in that situation. So I think it's really important for us both to put up an argument here about that it's not true people went like cattle without resistance. They tried to resist, but the reasons for the limitations of resistance, but also that inside the Second World War, it's not just a big po 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 argument about the big politics, but politics has played out. The left played a role inside that process, and the left could have shaped the way Europe developed right, and stuff in, in a way that sadly it didn't. There is a, a debate in Poland about uh, pre-war Poland, whether Polish people were anti-Semitic or whether they were not, <laughs> which of course uh, both is true, they were both uh, anti-Semitic Polish people and not anti-Semitic Polish people, and that's linked to the general politics of different organizations. So you had in uh, pre-war Poland, you had the, the bench ghettos in the universities, yeah, where Jewish students had to sit on special benches. This was enforced by the extreme right National Democrats, who also organized uh, gangs to beat up Jewish people on the street outside the university. It was in certain uh, years, it was a kind of no-go area for, for, for Jewish people. Um, uh, that was on, on the one hand. On the other hand, you had the, the socialist, um, the left that organized uh, brilliant uh, fights against this, also in the universities, uh, also the big May Day demonstrations, joint May Day demonstrations, where you had uh, speakers spoken Yiddish and speakers spoken Polish. So you had uh, both of those uh, traditions. Um, um, uh, we, uh, as, uh, um, as an organization in Poland, we had the, the great luck of actually meeting Marek Edelman and even uh, having the possibility to do some work with him. And that was uh, the occasion when a person from this pre-war national democratic, <laughs> so-called um, the extreme right tradition, became the Minister of Education in the government of Poland. And there was a brilliant walkout of students, a spontaneous march in the streets, uh, in that street where Jewish people were beaten up before the war, uh, which was a very spontaneous, very good uh, reaction. And after that, we uh, coordinated a, a meeting after that, organized a meeting. And Edelman wasn't able to come and speak there, but he wrote a brilliant statement about how you should go out in the streets and shout and fight this, uh, this minister and the whole tradition that he stands in. And that was... Uh, that was uh, very important to build up uh, a further anti-fascist movement. And also two, uh, two years ago we managed, when the fascists were organizing a march on the 11th of November, and they wanted to march exactly on the street past the university, uh, we managed to block them, the uh, broad anti-fascist movement. We managed to block them and force them to walk in some back streets uh, far away. And, uh, <laughs> But in the last period now, like Andy talked about, there have been some incidents where fascists have actually tried to interrupt meetings of left-wing lecturers or politicians in the universities. So uh, our work is, is now uh, going to be stepped up to stop these attacks. And uh, it is cru crucial that there are organized socialists in this anti-fascist movement to, to talk about confrontation 
and to talk about linking to, to the working class as well and uh, and uh, yeah to step up the fight. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Cam from Manchester. I just wanted to talk about um, sort of systematic segregation in um, in the UK at the moment and also um, building a sort of unite against fascism and anti-fascist um, movement at the moment. Uh, so first of all, um, when, you are, when you are in, if you're an ethnic minority and you apply for social housing, the police will do postcode checks on the area that you're going to be allocated to. So if they know that there's a very strong um, sort of presence of hate crime relating to fascism or right-wing ideas, then they will place you in a different area. So you get systematic segregation through the housing. Um, and also I just wanted to sort of bring up in, in Manchester on the 29th of September is the Tory party conference and we need to get everybody up there but not because of just the cuts and the ruling class ideas that are sort of squashing everybody um, but also because in the North West we have Nick Griffin, head of the BMP in, as um, the MEP for the North West and the net MEP election is going to be in May 2014 um, there is actually um, a campaign at the moment called Griffin Must Go, but it's in a very early stage and it really needs that boost. I mean, Tory Park Conference on the 29th of September is going to be huge, but we also need to put those anti-fascist um, sort of ideas into the community. I mean, um, just last month, 300 EDL marched in Ashton, um, which is in the outskirts of Manchester. And um, there's not... They're building in places that we're not... Um, so also the EDL also um, marched through the centre of Manchester a couple of months ago and that's the first time they have ever done that. So I just want to reiterate the importance of having the left in these areas and putting those arguments to them. Um, Lenin said it's a race for ideas and when, I mean a couple of weeks ago we sold um, a paper to um, an EDL supporter and, um, and the, the reason that's important is because he's never had those class politics put towards him. And so that's why, you know, those, uh, the BNP and the EDL are getting to those people before we do. Um, so it's important to go in the estates um, and build Unite Against Fascism um, and build those left-wing ideas and sort of put that forward. I'd just like to ask uh, a brief question, and by the way, I thought it was a uh, most inspiring talk. Um, could you kindly tell us uh, a bit more about, John, about the relationships, uh, insofar as there were relationships, between the two uprising in, uprisings in Warsaw towards the end of the war? Thank you. Yes, Margaret was from you Against Fascism, and we uh, just to thank you for the, the very interesting talk, and to say that UEF is actually involved now um, because of everything that people have been saying, the serious, serious dangers that we're facing across Europe. We are involved in um, working towards a fascist free Europe, um, an international organisation trying to come together to work among all the countries um, because of the serious nature of the, the rise of the far right. And also, um, from 4th to 7th November this year, we are taking a group of people to uh, Auschwitz, uh, a trip to Auschwitz. Hopefully, a whole number of students, trade unionists, perhaps one or two of the most sympathetic politicians, and um, hopefully getting union backing in the first place for this. And clearly, if we can take 50 people like that from across Britain, um, the sort of meetings that you could have to get funding and the sort of meetings when people come back uh, would, be, would be very, very good to build around in order to build the anti-fascist movement here. So I would urge you, if you're interested in going to see people um, at the stall, uh, myself or Paul afterwards, at the stall, or to or, uh, contact UEF at the office, uh, because I think this, this is the sort of way forward. We will produce materials <coughs> afterwards, video, um, poetry, book, photographs, etc., and do a, a tour of meetings. 
and the sort of stuff that you've been seeing, John, is, is really is, is fantastic. Hopefully we could build on that kind of information um, to try and make people understand, as you were saying, the necessity here for organisation. We actually have to organise to fight these Nazis now and not to wait until they get to the kind of strength that they did do before. We've got to say right now, we're going to stop them. And how we're going to do that, we're going to build to stop them. Um, sorry, before you start, we've got time for a couple more. But I thought, okay, go on. Yeah, I mean, I, I take on board what many speakers have said and what John said about the the importance of the book and the importance of dissecting the situation that the people in the ghetto found themselves in um, when, they, when they rose. But if anybody, and, and, and of course we have to avoid the idea of uh, romanticisation, but if anybody reads the book and doesn't come away incredibly moved and incredibly inspired by the fact that people in the worst possible conditions, the people in the worst against the modern industrialised army, the people who've been brutalised for nearly a decade and finally been herded like animals into, into, into a corner, can still fight back, can still kill their enemies, can still deliver a blow. And that, 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 that quote about every, every doorway becoming a fortress that's, that, that's not to be given up, they really haven't got what it's about. Yes, it is about the politics. Yes, it is about how we've got to avoid getting to those situations. Yes, it is a powerful weapon about the necessity for organisation. But beyond all those things, I think it's about the fact that we will always fight back against the bastards who try to come for us. That actually struggle is always there, it's always possible, and, and we should, we, we should, we, this is a testament to, 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 to the courage of people who can do that in those situations. Okay, there's now a sudden flurry of hands, so if people can be very short and sharp, we'll get everybody in. But that, yeah, okay. There's that quote, isn't there, about uh, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and, and certainly, clearly, obviously, the, the Warsaw Ghetto resistors were, were huge giants um, in every way. And I think, I don't, for anyone who hasn't read the book, my, my first uh, thoughts about it when I read it, uh, probably about a few years ago, um, and, it, and I actually want to say, I'm sure everyone, uh, feels this again. Bookmarks and John have done us a service, a real flipping service to the movement and to the real spirit of of, of uh, internationalism with with the real, which is very very welcome indeed. You read the book. My for what it's worth, I thought, no, I mean, you know, it's it's hard work because of what what these people went through. You know, it sounds obvious thing to say, but it, it's difficult it, and it's quite depressing in my opinion. And then you, you, you know you persevere. Um, it's not a criticism. It's, it, it's the way it was clearly. Um, you persevere with it, which is well worth doing, of course. And there's this fantastic incident. I think it was in the calf when uh, some people in the ghetto finally get some of the Nazis. They, there's a successful ambush. Now I remember Mark Steele talking about a similar thing a while back, and he really leapt out of his chair because he went, "Yes, they've done it. They've got some of them." And that's and that's that's one of the. It's a small incident, but it's worth its weight in gold in terms of, and the skill, you talk about the organisation, the skill, the organisation, and the essential timing. Time is everything in these things. They got some of the swines. Two or three other quick points. Um, I wonder how much it gave, this might be a foolish question, I'm not sure, I wonder how much it gave inspiration to other uh, resistors in places like Sobibor and, and, and other, other camps and so on. It was a great film somewhere, no one's ever read it, ever, ever seen the film, like you know, Jack Shepard. A very sad, it's a fantastic film about the breakout of the ball concentration camp. And it's true, obviously, what's true, and he says that the, the, the right, the anti Semitism in Poland today is still huge. It was seen a bit in the European Championships last year. You got Polish football fans, as Andy said, not only these uh, uniform thing, but large sections of Polish football fans organised Nazis or around organised Nazi groups, tolerated often by the police. And this is, moreover, as often this sort of stuff is, kicked off often, pardon the pun, kicked off often by sections of the Catholic Church, politicians in Parliament who get up and make openly anti-Semitic or coded anti-Semitic remarks vis-a-vis -vis people trying to claim compensation for the Holocaust in terms of property and so on, or the Catholic Church itself. Um, I could say much more about that, I won't. The other thing I think is organisation unity, unity solidarity. Yes, this is true. Um, in every way, but as, as John White and other people said, politics, politics, politics. I think the reason that UAF and other people got the, the 
potential disaster was right is the reason that Hassan Muhammad Ali said the other day because of years of patient, hard, consistent work in the localities, South East London, Lewisham, Catford, Greenwich, Woolwich, etc., etc. And then when Wool Wool Woolwich did happen in this country, there, were, there was a group of people around that made it a calmer situation than it could have been. Sally from Bookmarks, and yeah, just to back up the last couple of speakers, really, because it was years since I'd read the ghetto fights, and to do the new edition, we had to scan it in because we didn't have files. So I was going through um, the text of, of the for the new edition, and it really did make me feel like you know I've done this job for about three years, and it, it's never felt more important doing you know the, the kind of work that we do in terms of radical publishing. You know, reading those words and thinking that. You know, as John points out um, uh, uh, before, that it never appeared in English except in 1945 in, in New York, published um, by the Bund. And so the fact that Bookmarks brought it out 23 years ago and now is bringing it back into print again is fantastically important. And the kind of stories that you read in it, you know, it's, it's, there's the, the couple of big uh, fights that take place um, where they do, you know, kill numbers of, of Germans and stuff. But then there's also, you know, the smaller acts that, that or the, sorry, I, I don't mean the word small there, that's the wrong word, but the, the individual acts, you know, that, that Edelman talks about towards the end of the book of people who, when they're trying to get as many people as possible out of, of the ghetto and some people who are already injured or feel they might not make it out and literally use themselves as their the physical bodies as, as shields to allow other people to escape through tunnels and, and all of this. And I had to go for a long walk after going through that text just to be able to carry on and you know go back to the kind of day-to-day -day things that you do in an office. And I think uh, just in terms of why you should read the new edition as well, it's partly the kind of stuff John was talking out about at the beginning, but I think the new introduction and the appendix, which is uh, some letters, a, a, a debate that took place in the Jewish Chronicle after the last edition came out, <coughs> It doesn't just tell the story of you know pulling out the important political points about unity and, and organisation. It also tells of the importance of getting these uh, messages out. You know, getting out the understanding the history of, of the book, the Ghetto Fights, why it was kind of buried. You know, and the importance of our tradition in pulling it out again. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, my name's Barbara. Um, been very insightful, insightful what you've said. Um, my father was in the Warsaw Uprising. Um, but he was on the, well, not for this, he was one in the Polish Home Army. And uh, he, he lost his family. He never saw his family because he couldn't go back to Poland again after the Second World War because he could have been shot. And um, you're, you're absolutely right. I grew up with a very right wing father, very nationalistic father, um, very anti Semitic. Um, didn't really talk much about, no, well, he did talk a little bit about the war, but he's still alive, he's 86, but I don't know why Poles were so anti-Semitic, and also, yes, you're correct, he, he doesn't like the Germans and he doesn't like the Russians. <laughs> um, this will be the last contributor from the floor. Just an anecdote about Vienna, um, <clears throat> rather than Warsaw, but it was a story about a relative of mine who was a um, teenager in Vienna in 1938, and in the CP and organising and so on, got out because of what was going on. So I'm not sure about the history of what happened in Vienna, where there was any uh, resistance. But I went back with them to Vienna, and uh, they took me on the road that they used to walk to school. And all of a sudden, we came to this square, and there was a funny atmosphere in the square, and I wasn't quite sure. And then I saw the name of the square, and it was called Judenplatz, so Jewish square. And in the middle of this square is this enormous square block. And I didn't know what it was, and I went up to it, and actually it was books in, in stone uh, all the way around, um, several feet high. And this, of course, was the site where they burnt the books. So going back to what John was saying about how would I have reacted with that level of intimidation as a Jew in Vienna in 1938, I don't know. But I think that um, the explanation that John has given about how people took so long to organize themselves is, is quite understandable. And um, it certainly taught me that I never want to get to that situation where people are burning books and threatening me um, or anybody else come to that. 
and the fight against fascism continues and we can see what's happening in Europe. And yes, congratulations to the work that's been done in this country because so far we've managed to keep them down. Okay, thanks very much because it was a, a really great discussion. Um, just a, a couple of small points where I address the, some of the questions that were raised. Um, so one or two funny things which I meant to mention before. When the book, first book came out, I did a tour of the campuses and the Union of Jewish Students turned up at most of them and the LSE they turned up. And I just measure that this is the London School of Economics who would imagine some rather intelligent Jewish students. And their first question was, and it wasn't ironic, what is this Bund? Is it a branch of the Socialist Workers' Party? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you that it is, and this is also quite a funny story. Marek Edelman is a remarkable man, and he also liked a glass of whiskey or two. And I met him twice. The second time I met him was in, 18, uh, in 1997. <laughs> oh, no, the, it was at 1997 Centenary Conference of the Bund in Warsaw in a hotel. And I walked into a door and had a glass of whiskey in his hand, and he said, Ha, huh, Trotskyist. <laughs> and actually, in the first edition, I had to have a disclaimer saying that... Um, he got nothing to do with Trotsky, and the first edition had a long discussion about the United Front, which I only do as a footnote in this edition. Anyway, so, a remarkable man, and by the way, remarkable in another sense, solidarity. He wrote that, I couldn't get this into, the, into this edition. Um, uh, the, the, the letter he wrote to the Palestinian fighters is completely fascinating, and a letter of solidarity, but also criticising them for suicide bombing. And they begin a dialogue, utterly, uh, just wonderful. Anyway, some, some, of the, some of the points that were raised. Cy Englert, who spoke first, by the way, the author of the article on the Bund I mentioned, asked me about the sectarianism of the Bund in the ghetto, more information. This is a really tricky subject, obviously very sensitive and under-researched for obvious reasons. I'll just give you my understanding of it. The Bund was of the view that they had very, very strong relations with the Polish Socialist Party before the Nazis came in. That, that was there made for very good reasons, for obvious reasons. The ally between Jewish socialists and non-Jewish socialists. Strong alliance against fascism. Their view was that was a much more successful uh, solidarity resistance than with the Zionist socialists. That was their, even the Zionist socialists. That was their judgment. More so in the ghetto. And what seems to have happened, they, 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 were, they, were, they were over-reliant on the Polish Socialist Party, which of course has vanished. They are on the wrong side of the wall. And I, what, this is my judgment of this, but I think it's important is that, and we all know about this, kind of an ingrained routinism. These, this, is, this is the older leadership of the Bund. And my goodness, the conditions they were living in, not surprising that they kind of hung on to what had seemed to, be, seemed to work in the past. They hung on to it, they hung on to it too much. They couldn't conceive of working with the Zionists in the way that was necessary. And it's very fascinating that the solid, there's, a, there's a generational thing, it's the youth. The fighters are the youth. They're nearly all teenagers. From the three organisations, the Communists, the Zionists and the Bund, they're nearly all youth. There's a lot more work to be done on this. Clearly, I haven't got time to, to dwell on it even longer. Um, but it's, a, it, 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 it's, it's, it's an important point. Um, Mike Bradley, I'm, you know, my goodness me. Um, I'm, <laughs> Mike says, don't underdo not being too romantic. Yeah, yeah I, I accept that. I actually want to just, um, if I may, uh, compliment Mike on his review of Life and Fate, which is the, I mentioned the Grossman novel about the fight in Stalingrad. And you begin the book by looking at Mike's review. And if you Google Life, Fate, uh, 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 Stalingrad, Bradley, uh, you'll get the review straight away. And I strongly recommend that. Um, on the argument, it's not necessarily in order. Um, the, um, the question of the inspiration of the ghetto to the other ghettos, it certainly was. But something else that needs further research, although there are books on it, it wasn't just in the ghettos. And not, not only in different parts of Poland, some of the ghetto fighters who got out of the ghetto secretly went into the forests. There was a completely separate struggle of partisan fighters in the forest, armed, that give, gave the Nazis quite, quite a lot of difficulty. That's also a wonderful aspect of the struggle and certainly inspired by the, the, the resistance. Um, the, the question of the relations between 43 and 44, I can't possibly go further into that. It's a very important question. All I can suggest is uh, there's a, uh, Danny Gluckstein, Donny Gluckstein, has written a very important book about underground resist. Partly, it's partly about underground resistance throughout the war, and not just in Poland. It has a chapter on Poland which touches on some of the themes that you raise, and there's bibliography in that. There's also uh, Polonsky touches on that, and uh, again, there's bibliography of my own in, in, in the own introduction. Um, it doesn't require further ex exploration. I can't, there's not much more I can say about that now. I really like Sasha's point about. You know, sort of just cut away all, all the other factors, just the fact that in the end people fight back, and that is a terribly important factor. Whatever the difficulties, 
that the scale of the oppression in the end just absolutely forced people to fight back. I'm going to really sum up on this point. It's my very last point. I was just really struck by the, um, the, by the daughter of the Polish underground fighter who's also so anti-Semitic. So anti-Semitic were her words. And I was thinking, I don't know how, how, how he is at age 86. I was just thinking to myself, what a shame he's not here. And I would have said, if the meeting doesn't convince him, and I can't, Andrew Zabrowski would have done. Thank you. <laughs>